Hello, everyone. Thank, thanks, thanks for coming out this afternoon. I'm here to present kind of the initial results of a series of studies into the off-grid um, solar electricity sector in Africa that our research group undertook under the new and shortened title of Off-Grid Solar in Sub-Saharan uh, Africa with the question mark, is it sustainable energy? Um, um, as you might have heard, um, there's a bit of a boom going on in the uh, African solar space uh, over the last decade. And the question is not whether solar is sustainable in the sense that you know it, it's renewable energy, it's some of that sense, but rather is the promise of the of the sector being met as far as delivering durable solutions, energy to people that lasts and provides long-term value and impact. So that's what we're looking at. And why is there this um, this movement in in sub-Saharan Africa in particular with respect to solar energy, solar electricity? Well, it's because the continent uh, is home to massive populations that still do not have reliable um, electricity access. And according to IA estimates, uh, hundreds of millions of people don't have any electrification to speak of really whatsoever. So what's happened is we, we have um, this trend of um, globally, global trends with reducing solar PV panel prices and other, other factors that have contributed to a, to a massive growth of solar energy worldwide, combined with the host of sort of the traditional negative factors regarding um, the grids in Africa and diesel generators, which are dirty and widely used in the sector, and all these other things that have combined to leave so many people not electrified in the first place. And the thought is that now might be the time and Africa might be the place where we really can start uh, seeing sort of this win-win situation where we can start to scale up electrification, deliver energy access at scale in sort of a renewable uh, way using distributed clean energy, right? And maybe unlike the talk that was presented for those of you that were here last Monday, maybe this is really a win-win scenario for the various um, sustainability development goals of the United Nations, most notably the energy access and the, and, the, and the climate change goals, but a number of the other 17 goals that are also uh, related to this. So sure enough, we can see what's happened in, um, in Sub-Saharan Africa. You don't have to see too many of the details of what this graph is exactly, just showing the growth curve of the sales of solar, solar products. Um, this is globally, so about half of these are in Sub-Saharan Africa, and the other half are mostly in India and other parts of South Asia. And, um, and, and marginally in the rest of the world. But, but as you can see, you know, through, through the, um, uh, about a year ago, through June 2015, there was sort of this exponential um, growth here. This is, these are cumulative sales in millions. So up in the last uh, you know, five years, uh, verified sales have been well over 10 million in, in Africa alone and globally sort of approaching um, over, well over 20 million. And possibly th those are pretty conservative estimates. It's probably closer to 50 million. Um, solar PV sales worldwide. And this is a private um, sector industry, really. It, these are sales we're talking about. They're not necessarily donations. These, these are just sales numbers from a number of manufacturers. But it's not a wholly private um, sector enterprise. The, the way this market has developed is that it's been really supported by the World Bank, International Finance Corporation, by various development agencies, um, by, by NGOs, uh, private public partnerships by local governments, especially rural electrification agencies in a number of the countries, and increasingly by these impact investors that, that seek some, some financial return on their investments. So they'll invest in private companies, but really for them, uh, getting the greater, greatest financial possible return on their investment is maybe not their number one priority. What they want to do is also deliver, deliver social benefits that um, we think uh, follow through thanks to energy access and electrification, especially maybe better household budgets, better productivity, income, better health outcomes, education outcomes, etc. So not surprisingly, because the industry has been built up with these supporters, the leading sort of players in this space are what we call social enterprises, right? So these are private, for-profit companies, but they're not, again, focused on necessarily getting the greatest financial return. They want to be cash flow positive. They want to return some money to their investors, but they're also interested in really delivering sort of broader social spillovers, and again, especially health, education, productivity, and, and so forth. And so um, they've been the ones really driving this market. And, and the other thing to note here is that these sales numbers and some of, some of uh, the other anecdotal data that's out there, as well as our experiences in the field, that the demand for these solar units uh, seems to be real in a sense that maybe cook stoves and some other technologies might not have been, right? You talk to people and just a testament to these sales figures is that people seem to really be willing to adopt this and you know, put out money to buy, to buy these sorts of products. 
So let's just take a quick step back and say, you know, you know what are the products we're talking about? So we start at, the, at sort of the very bottom of the end, and what the, what the sales figure was previously showing is the sales for sort of these small solar lanterns. I brought a few props today. And this is just um, really a small, um, you know, a small solar light where it just, you know, has three levels of brightness. I don't know if you can see with the lights, but you, they either have a sort of solar panel built into the back or you attach a small external panel, as is the case here. And um, this is what sort of the market development support has focused on from, from the World Bank, from the International Finance Corporation. They've tried to get really a mass rollout of these. So those 45 million sales that we were just reported are really just for these sorts of products. And the idea is that you deploy these at scale on a very affordable basis. These usually cost less than $10 nowadays, sometimes $8. So affordable, in theory, even to the bottom of the economic pyramid, right? Even the poorest of the poor in rural areas in developing countries and they'll adopt these at an affordable price point, become familiar with solar technology, start to trust it, and then be willing to invest in slightly bigger systems, which in this case are the so-called advanced solar lanterns, which are pretty much like this, only a little bit bigger, and they last longer, and they might be able to also charge your phone. Right? And once you get comfortable with that um, sort of technology, the idea is that you'll continue climbing a it's conceptualized as an energy ladder. And so the next rung up, we start to talk about small solar home systems. Now, these are analogs of, say, a household-sized system you might see here in California that, that has solar on their roof. But it's quite different in the sense that these are off-grid populations. They're not connected to some national grid. And we're talking about systems whose panel size is you know, order, at least an order of magnitude smaller than what you'd see in California. So we're talking about you know, panels only this size, about, you know, about 50 watts or less. But nevertheless, they're connected to a central battery. It tends to be maybe small, such as this one. And at this point, you can connect it to sort of cables that are you know, 10, 20 meters in length. But you, know, you start to get lights that look sort of like you know, traditional household lighting you might get. And this model is sort of at the, at the lower end of the spectrum. And this is called a solar home system, because at this point, you've attached it to a house. And you can hook up your cell phone. There's an easy panel. And, and so, so you start to get a little bit of electricity. And the idea is you progressively climb this energy ladder, right? So, so the idea is then you get to the mid-range solar home systems, which are pretty much the same thing. Bigger battery starts to look more like a car battery. And maybe you switch away because of that from a, from a lithium ion battery to a traditional lead acid battery, which really is just like a car battery that we have. And then you can start connecting some radios to it. And you just continue moving on up the system. Some of these bigger solar home systems, you can even power small fridges, definitely some efficient uh, TVs, maybe not the standard TVs, uh, certainly not traditional ones, but as we get more and more energy efficient appliances, even you know, a 150 or 200 watt panel can, can readily power these electronics. So that's really exciting. And sort of the ultimate triumph would be if a lot of, if this people you know, started from the bottom of the pyramid slowly over a period of time, climbed up these different runs of the energy ladder, and they all sort of hooked up their own um, distributed generation to each other or to some centralized solar point in their village and created these sorts of mini grids. Right, so we have people, in theory, climbing the energy ladder and deriving electrification for themselves and the benefits of electric lighting and electric appliances, but also sort of gaining a whole bunch of additional social welfare benefits for themselves, um, desirable social spillovers, which is why this industry is being promoted by social enterprises and, and so for themselves and the community at large. And best of all, well, I don't know if best of all, but in addition for, 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 for climate change issues, right? Like this is a good way to provide electrification in a new way to a region rather than doing it the same dirty old way that, that we used to do it here, right? So that's, um, so that's the theory. However, surprisingly to us, even though we've seen this, um, this trend of massive sales over the last decade, um, there's a remarkable kind of lack of data other than the sales figures which I just showed you about what's actually happening after a product is sold. So we know these products are sold. We know people are pulling money out of their wallets. You know, they're hard earned, usually agricultural income and paying for these products and adopting them at whatever scale. But that's kind of usually where the story ends, right? And we find out that there was a sales made. But there's a whole host of um, essentially assumptions that the industry is built upon that we're tr now trying to start to fill. And the most important um, one of these that is, that is foundational for the industry and enables it to attract market development support is that um, these solar products will displace kerosene, right? That's a dominant source of lighting in these areas. And kerosene is both polluting for the household, leads to sort of micro level effects within the household where children that are studying by them might be getting 
sick because of it and also on a broader scale there's some research that was also discussed last week as far as kind of the black carbon contributions of, of kerosene based lighting globally right so we have that and also the other thing that's talked about less but in the industry that's talked about a lot is you know the double AA, a triple a disposable batteries which are very cheap and very readily available all throughout Africa and even here we don't always recycle them but there they're almost sure to just be tossed you know to the to the ground and then bad chemicals leach into the into the ground and then into the water and so that creates a whole other sort of environmental hazards that we're hoping to eliminate with this industry the other is you know the idea that in addition to lights and and maybe charging your cell phones you're also uh, creating greater use of radios and TVs and other appliances providing um, co connectivity in that way uh, and that the idea is that once people have electrification, they'll, they'll put it to productive use, right? Like they're not just going to enjoy their lives, they're going to start making money off of this. And immediately one of the things that's most proposed is that people will at least start doing cell phone charging businesses, right? If I'm the only one or one of only a handful of people in my village that has a, um, a solar product, I might use it to, to, you know, to be an entrepreneur and charge phones for other people that don't have uh, electricity in their house. So now they don't have to walk, uh, you know, um, Farther to the farther away kiosk, now they come to my house and charge their phones there. Um, and then the general idea is that there is this energy ladder that people are climbing on, and that the best way to deliver these solutions is through social enterprises, right? So these are all kind of assumptions that are out there that we're trying to, we've started to try to fill in with some data and follow up and to see to which extent these things um, are realized once a, um, once a solar product. Is, is, is sold. So, and, and more fundamentally, we just don't know who it is exactly, which populations buy these products, and how they actually use them in real life. Um, so, again, this is just kind of saying the same things, and we're going to try to fill in on the right that whether these assumptions are at the conclusion, hopefully, fill in what we can't say and what open questions are left about the industry um, based on this initial data. So, our research approach was we partnered with one commercial manufacturer of um, solar home systems bigger than this one I showed you here in a different manufacturer than the one I, I just showed here. But the idea was we interviewed all their new adopters at, in the shops at the time they would either buy their product or at the time of installation in their, house, in their houses. We sent, uh, we sent uh, you know, researchers that we hired and, and sort of embedded in the shop, but they worked for us, not for the company, to go and interview people at the time that they bought their solar home system at the time or at the time that it was being installed on their roof, essentially. And these were two brand new shops that were being opened up, one in Western Kenya, one in uh, Western Uganda, so slightly different settings. But uh, they were sort of the first um, offerings of this size in their, in, their, in their regions, even though these small end lanterns, and, which are often called the Pico PV products, they'd been widely available um, in those locations for, for at least uh, three years before in both settings. So you could go to basically any gas station or a number of other vendors and, and buy these if, if you wanted them. But these were the first kind of larger systems that you didn't have to travel to the, to the capital city, to Nairobi or Kampala, or to kind of a bigger regional center to get. So we managed to get about uh, 500 people interviewed, total in both countries. And then we did another round of inline interviews um, for most people about two to five months after adoption, some of them more than a year after they'd, they'd, owned, uh, they'd owned the system. And uh, we focused on solar home systems. One, because we thought it was kind of an interesting scale to start looking at. Um, of course, you know, a small solar lantern is interesting in itself, but you can only do so much. Right? At, at most, you can imagine maybe this place is one kerosene lamp or maybe two at most. And we were sort of interested, like, if the ultimate goal is to move people up the energy ladder, what do we expect to find once people do get relatively large systems, right? What do they do when they do have large uh, and what starts to look really like modern energy access and not just something that's maybe an appropriate technology for rural development, but something that looks more like what you and I have at home, you know, light switches on the walls and lights hanging overhead and a TV or radio and things like that. And also because, although that was the goal to get people to that level of energy access for the industry, there wasn't much, um, um, you, know, you know, all the industry supporters were really focused at the time. This was uh, 2014, 2015, uh, in 2013 actually, starting late 2013, looking at the small lanterns, right? They were still trying to deploy them on a mass scale and get that base set up so people would climb up this energy ladder and we thought we'd you know, jump ahead a little bit and see what we can expect to find out. So with that being said, the, the first thing we found out was that for solar home system adopters, kerosene was still the dominant um, source of lighting. So we asked people what sort of lights they use in their, their houses and you can see that you know, for both countries here, kerosene is by far the most widely used uh, source of light and solar lamps, kind of the smaller types of solar lamps, relatively little. Here in Kenya, some of these overhead bulbs are about a third of them are also powered by solar panels, but in general, much less so than, than kerosene lights. 
And although a lot of people use their cell phones as lights and just regular old flashlights with batteries, when you dig deep, you find out that those are really mostly used for walking around between houses or at most going to the bathroom at nighttime and uh, you know, for less than one hour a day, whereas kerosene lights are by far the primary source of light. And when you ask people what's the most important or the, what's the most used source of light, kerosene, kerosene lamps win the day. So, for, so even for large solar home systems, we, we, we appear to see people going from kerosene as their source of lighting to a relatively large solar home system rather than having gone through, say, the first rungs of, of the energy ladder there. So that was uh, uh, one of the first findings. The other thing we found out was that although, they, although these people that were adopting solar lights looked like the bottom of the economic pyramid in terms of their use of kerosene, they were very different than what we'd expect as far as education level goes. Like these were very, like to our extent, shockingly highly educated individuals. When you compare them to national statistics, this is at least two to three times the national, their regional rates, even for women in Uganda, which is, you know, uh, Uganda, less developed country than Kenya. Women traditionally a, a lot less educational opportunities. Fully a quarter of the people had finished high school or, and most of them, this is not even just some post-secondary education, an overwhelming majority of these had actually finished a university study, at least a two-year course. So, so really, really high education rates that don't look anything like the bottom of the economic pyramid. So these are the well-educated rural that we're buying the, uh, the products. Similarly, you might on the outside, so this is a picture of, uh, of Uganda where we had, this is one of our enumerators running around saying hi to the kids. You know, these houses might look like they're poor, the bottom of the kind of room at first glance, but oftentimes when you step inside, you find something that looks like this, right? This is not what you expect from like uh, necessarily an off-grid, in, in maybe in our mind, uh, an African hut or something, right? It might look poor on the outside, it's often not on the inside. Right? And similarly, sometimes even the outside of the houses would look really nice, right? You can see here, here's the relatively large panel on them, you know, what looks like a really nice house, right? So, so further kind of idea that the, the solar home system adopters are not the bottom of the pyramid is also just if you look at their appliance ownership rates, even though cell phones and radios are widely owned in both countries amongst people in the regions and nationally, we have significantly higher rates of ownership of those amongst the people that bought solar home systems. And uh, in Kenya, even for TVs and DVD players, quite a few people already had TVs, close to 40% reported having TVs before they even bought a solar home system, right? So, so now the poorest of the poor, and we have some other data there as far as, um, you know, not as reliable, but you know, the typical kind of survey data on income expenditure and the like that kind of supports the idea that these are not the poorest of the poor that are buying these. And, and you, you, you might say, well, yeah, right, you're talking about systems, and I should have mentioned this, that cost, you know, $150 to $300, even though they're being sold on credit, they have to have pay a monthly fee of at least $8, $10, $15 a month. Uh, sure, the poorest of the poor can afford this. And so, yes, that's right, but let's just remember that what we're trying to do here is we're, we're testing the assumption that people have sort of been climbing up this energy ladder, maybe making greater productivity use of their, of their earlier kind of bottom rungs of solar PV products and gotten to this point. But instead, what we seem to be seeing is people that were regardless relatively well off just waiting until a product that met their needs came to their market and then they jumped in and they bought it. And it's not like they, they slowly got wealthier over time using other means of electricity, right? They were wealthy usually because they owned a lot of cattle or a lot of land or were otherwise successful farmers in this case. Right? So those are the populations that chose to buy, uh, to buy the systems. The, and, and that's sort of consistent with the idea that we didn't really see anything about uh, conclusively looking like the energy ladder that I described in concept, right? What we saw was a lot of people that went straight from having absolutely no, um, certainly no solar PV products, only about a third in Kenya and only a little more than 10% in Kenya had some sort of previous experience with off-grid solar energy. And they went straight to a, you know, a large solar home system, right? So they jumped all those bottom rungs of the, of the energy ladder. So we had a lot of people just adopting off-grid solar at that point, right? So there was no climbing the energy ladder for them. Similarly, quite a few people, fully half in Kenya and a little less than a quarter in, is that a little less, less than Uganda, had some sort of other modern energy source. And what do we mean by modern? So we're talking about solar PV, but also about diesel or petrol generators, um, the grid, national grid, relatively few people, and also a lot of car batteries that would be charged at kiosks and people would connect various appliances to, to car batteries. So, and it's just not clear for these, and, and you know, for these populations, is the adoption of a solar home system now, is that moving up the energy ladder, is it moving down? You know, it could be argued either way. And sort of the conclusion I'm increasingly coming to is that 
the energy ladder concept is not a particularly useful one to have in the first place, that there's just people tend to adopt whatever is available in their marketplace and seems to meet their needs. And so we should probably uh, start to look away a little bit from this approach to market development. But I mentioned it only because in practice, this is exactly how the market is being supported, right? The UN and uh, World Bank and impact investors, they're all focused at kind of the low end products because the idea is, this is how the market is being developed. Therefore, this is where our limited resources are going to make the, the most use, right? And the idea is maybe we should try to think of more effective ways to make use of those limited market development resources that are out there. Um, so, um, so, so that assumption seems to not be being met. But what does seem to be being met, and this is Kenya and Uganda looks much the same, is that uh, if, if you look at the pre and post sort of energy sources that people had in their homes before and after solar home system adoption, you see a big drop in the use of kerosene a big, big drop in the number of phones that are being charged outside people's households, a not so big drop in, 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 um, in the purchase of disposable batteries, and the large increase, unsurprisingly, of people that own solar, solar energy, right? Because they've, they've just bought this system. So of course, we, we expect to see that jump, right? So this is, um, this is really interesting because this, this is one of the first, so, so you know, there's nothing conclusive we can say here. It's, it's just an observational thing where we went in and we see what happened before and after, but it was a relatively short time frame, And this is at least the first kind of um, relatively large scale, hundreds of uh, observations showing that some people have actually stopped using kerosene because all the anecdotal evidence to date and a few published research reports that have come out for these kind of, these smaller lights have been that surprisingly and to some people disappointingly, these just seem to be additive, right? People seem to continue using kerosene exactly the same way they did before, and they just add an additional light point, right? Which kind of makes sense, right? You'd have to buy at least, most households have five or six or more kerosene lights, so you'd have to buy five or six of these to truly start displacing kerosene. And if you're gonna do that, you might as well start buying a solar home system, right? So people haven't really looked at this at solar home systems before, and this is some of the first proof that, um, or at least suggestion that, that, that there is some kerosene displacing potential of, of, of off-grid solar PV products, right, which could be exciting. Um, interesting to know that this figure actually sort of underestimates the weight because this just shows people that completely stop using kerosene. We have a number of other people, a little bit um, more than Kenya and about 40% in Uganda that kept using kerosene even, even, even after they bought their solar home system, but they used it less. So here on the left, this shows the, the chart, the black line is people's use of kerosene lights before they bought their solar solution. And the red line is their use of the solar lights and the solar home system after they bought it. And you see kind of this remarkable overlap, right? People that stopped using kerosene altogether used their solar lights in ex for exactly the same lengths of time that they, they used their, um, uh, that they previously used their kerosene lights, right? Whereas for, for people that kept using kerosene, the red line and the, and the solid black line still overlap quite a bit. But you see that the dashed line, which shows the continuing use of kerosene, has sort of shifted to the left, meaning whereas before solar, <coughs> excuse me, most people used to use three to six hours of, of kerosene a day. Now they're only using it, the overwhelming majority is only using it one to three hours a day, right? So the displacement of kerosene um, seems to be happening even for those that haven't completely disadopted it, right? And, um, and, and that's, that's also encouraging. And the other thing to note is we're not talking about the same thing, right? We're not talking about the same kind of light just powered by a different means. If solar lights work, like this, this light, and especially sort of this light, is just sort of like a nice LED bulb is just qualitatively better than a dim, kind of smelly kerosene lantern, right? It's not like you've just plugged in a different power source for it. It's better, brighter, kind of. It's hard to find people that argue that kerosene is qualitatively better. They might argue that maybe it's more reliable in some sense or easily available, but, but not that it's kind of a better lighting source, right? So you're probably doing more with these lights, and I suspect the reason you see kind of this exact overlap here might be because it's been a relatively short time period, right? Most people are being interviewed here at the end line only less than six months after they bought their system. So maybe they haven't realized that they can maybe do more with this light and they just happen to be using it in exactly the same way. They used to use kerosene lights, but you know, in the long term, we might expect this to actually change and hopefully they use it more. Um, so, so, so the other, uh, but one thing that we did notice with the lights was where they were not being used like kerosene was being used before was for cooking. Right? So we see that both endline and baseline for kerosene using users, almost nine out of 10 or more, almost 100 in Uganda, used kerosene lights for cooking in the kitchens. But for the solar home systems, that wasn't happening. So why? So you look at this uh, picture here. So here's an interview taking place and here's one of the women of the household and she's cooking, this is the kitchen, but the main house is here. So if you electrify the main house, 
you put up the solar lights there, oftentimes people don't draw out one of these lights, either because the cord is too short or just because there's other areas of the house to illuminate, they don't bother ele electrifying the kitchen. So the kerosene light continues in the kitchens and you see at least we have data that was actually taken at the same time that we were doing our surveys in Kenya by, um, by USAID, kind of broad demographic surveys, showing that two thirds of the households in this exact area where we were doing our studies and nationally uh, cook outdoors or in structures separate to the, to the household. So this might be a case where if we want to get the most out of solar home systems, especially as far as gender disparities, we might want to focus on trying to, to make sure that the products are designed in such a way that um, areas of the house or the household compound where women are working, especially in the dark, should be electrified as well and not just kind of the most comfortable areas where, where the men and, uh, tend to socialize or the children tend to read. Uh, another sort of interesting finding we found as far as the use of the lights was that um, there was a huge demand to use these as, as security products. Um, they being now have electric lighting. I'm going to string one up on the front of my porch. I'm not going to put it in the kitchen, but I will hang it on the porch and I'll just leave it on overnight to scare away thieves, even though this seemed to be relatively low crime areas or scare away snakes or other wild animals or, or somehow keep, keep the cattle being happier at night seemed to be the common argument, right? Everybody wanted to, to leave a light on. The problem is, um, you can't really do that, right? We're still constrained by a battery. It's not like the grid you and I have where we turn it on and we count on our lights to stay on. To keep these products affordable, the batteries are only of a certain size and you're gonna quickly drain the system if you're leaving lights on overnight, or especially if you start to leave them on more than six or for the particular products we're looking at more than 10 hours a day, it has a real chance of damaging the battery um, for, the, for the long term. So we see in Kenya that happened a lot less than in Uganda, but that we know was an effort just by talking with the commercial manufacturer of them becoming aware of this problem and really having this customer education effort by the Kenyan sales people telling them, hey, this will not work as a security light, turn it off, in some cases even threatening people that they would not respect their warranty. Like if this breaks and we find out you were using a, a security light, we're, we're not gonna fix your system, right? So, so the idea is, okay, that seems to be effective in some sense, in the sense that the rates of Kenya are doing this, but does it scale and does it really make your customers happy if they thought they could do something and then you turned around and said, no, 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 you can't do that, right? So possibly we have a ways to go again as far as product design or possibly having a much lower wattage, maybe a dimmer bulb that can be left on for hours a day, you know, some sort of other way in which we can manage expectations and just educate end users about use. Because again, sometimes the intuitive way to use this product is to, you know, quote, misuse it in the sense that you just leave it on all the time and, and maybe you're watching a soccer match on your new TV and it dies when it dies because the power has run out and you're fine with that. But what you don't realize is that if you do that every single day, you're actually killing the lifetime of your battery and damaging your system. Um, but back to the kind of the assumptions where the basic assumptions for the industry that we're trying to test is another one was that, you know, in addition to kerosene, which we did see this placement of, there would be, you know, the AA, AAA disposable batteries would start to go away too. And we didn't see, we didn't really see any of that. And if we kind of step back and think about it, we can realize that well, what are disposable batteries used for? They're used for flashlights and for radios overwhelmingly. And unlike cell phones or lights, neither one of those is a product that you can readily plug into a solar home system, right? There's just not that many rechargeable flashlights being sold. And for the radios that are sort of DC powered ones that you can hook up to solar home systems, you probably have to buy a new one and you can't use your existing one that you've traditionally owned. But you'll, you'll recall we had high rates of ownership already. Um, so in fact, we saw, um, relatively low reductions in both places of people that actually stopped buying, buying these batteries. So, so that was um, not quite happening, but it raises the big point that I just mentioned of people sort of pre-invest in appliances sometimes even be before they have energy. So this person here on the left, you'll see they have, it's a blurry picture, but there's kind of a large radio here that's powered by size D batteries. And this one is I think powered by double A's, right? And I think at the time I was there, both of these were working, certainly this one was. And you can see here, here's their kind of battery for their solar home system. So if they were to stop, but they didn't buy a solar radio, right? They didn't choose to adopt one of those. So the idea was, well, if you, if you want to stop using dry cell batteries, now the, your radios are just gonna serve as an expensive stand for your new battery, right? You can't use them, right? If you still wanna listen to the radio, you have to keep buying, uh, you have to keep buying disposable batteries or you have to buy a new radio. And this is kind of an extreme case, but this person had all sorts of audio equipment and DVD equipment and a, and, a, uh, and a traditional inefficient TV. If you note here, there's a little bit of red. So he also has a diesel generator. That's how he's actually, so, so this is not your typical household, but, but nevertheless, this is kind of an extreme example of, of this point is that quite a few people had actually invested in TVs and DVD players, even when they had absolutely no means to power them. 
So especially in Kenya, you saw, uh, I think we had 40% of people did have a TV, but more than half of them had no means to power that TV whatsoever. And these were all kind of traditional cathode ray tubes, fat, heavy, terrible TVs, not energy efficient. And, but they had them, right? And there they were. And are you using it? No, why not? I don't have a power source, right? And, uh, and similar story to a slightly lesser scale for, for DVD players. Uh, so what's happening here, you know, you know, it's hard to say there might be a status symbol. Oftentimes there seems to be like a good deal or you can buy it from a family member in the city, you, you bring it home, but, and you're just kind of hoping that someday the grid will come and you'll, you too will be able to watch TV. Um, so, so, so it's there. Um, and the question is, is it the fact that these sorts of gadget enthusiasts are your likely audience for solar home system? Is it the kinds of people that tend to buy a TV even when they don't have electricity are also likely to adopt solar? Um, maybe. Um, but it could also be the case, and this is not mutually exclusive necessarily, that if we didn't have this going on, then, uh, then more people might adopt this, right? People might be reluctant to adopt the off-grid solar uh, product and might hold out for the grid in, in the hopes that being able to power their appliances they've already invested money in, right? They might be, especially with respect to radios, which are owned by, I think, 90% in both countries and overwhelmingly and used a lot of the time and powered by, by um, my batteries, right? Like I might not want to buy, I have a functioning radio. It's cheap for me to buy radios. I want to use that one. Why should I buy a new one? So the interesting thing here was that the Kenya shop actually, um, unlike the Uganda one, forced people, like they bundled radios with every single solar home system they sold. They, there was no choice. You couldn't just get the lights and the cell phone charging capability. And sure enough, that was a way to ensure that you, you got adoption of new radios, but how many customers did you miss out on because they didn't do that? And also we have, uh, I'm running out of time, so I won't talk about that now, but um, those radios were being able to be used much less because it turns out in these countries, a lot of people leave uh, radios on for 10, 12, 14, sometimes 24 hours a day. They're just constant background noise, right? And at first I thought my enumerators were making a mistake and needed retraining. And I said, hey, pay attention to this question. You're writing 20 hours a day of radio use. And they pushed back, like, no, no, th this is happening. This is how people use radios, right? Like it's just news, entertainment, it's on all the time for a lot of people. And you can't do that with a solar home system powered radio. At most you can listen to it five, six hours a day. So, um, so that's that, but you know, what we did see was sort of this big extensive, um, displacement of outside the home cell phone charging network. Right? People did now have an in-house capability to charge their cell phones, so they no longer did that, and that was exciting. Um, what we didn't see was that they actually started up charging businesses. So although a large number of people, about half in Uganda and about a third in Kenya, did charge phones for other people, they seemed to do it mostly as an informal way thing once in a while for neighbors or family, and mostly they didn't charge any money for it. Only about 10% of people are actually making any money off of having this phone charging capability. And these weekly rates of you know a dollar and a half or two and a half dollars are kind of peanuts even for those populations, right? They, nobody's making big money off of it. And it speaks to the wider point that most people did not use this as a productive asset, right? It was a purely domestic product. At most, we saw people like this person, where I don't know if you can see here, here's like a little bulb that he strung up in his family, um, little shop that's attached, you know, the bedroom is behind this wall, the living room is behind this wall, so it's just a, a shop that's attached to the house, and they put a light point there, but that wasn't what enabled them to start the business. They had the shop before, they just happened to put one of their six lights there, right? Like life goes on as before. It was the solar home system didn't make any difference. And if you just ask people, what, what is this product good for? They'll talk to you about, it, you know, it, it's, I socialize, it's nice to have lights. And, um, and, you know, so this maybe undermines one of the supports for the industry that, you know, this is a productive asset, we really want to drive it for development. But I don't know, I mean, maybe we shouldn't be so judgmental about it. Maybe, you know, is the industry any less worthy of support if it turns out that people just like having nice LED bulbs in their house and hanging out with their friends and watching TV. I don't know, maybe, do we, do we take away the market development support if, if that turns out to be the case? So, um, so we'll see. So, the, so, so along those lines, you know, there is these assumptions again that productivity, income, health, education might be happening. And I just kind of to wrap up, want to emphasize that those are sort of second order impacts. And um, those all essentially rest on a, one assumption that's not been verified is that you have to have long-term use. If people aren't using these products for the long-term after they buy them, then it's impossible to have any of these sort of additional outcomes. You must have people really want, so the demand is there, the sales are happening, but is there long-term use that's happening? And um, you know, this is an easy question to ask, but we found, and maybe we can cover more in the Q&A, that we found this really hard to study in the field where we try to probe the incentives, especially for social enterprises, to sort of deliver durable energy solutions that last. And one particular tension seemed to be um, 
the, the desire to scale, the desire to get as many products out in the field as quickly as possible versus the, the ability to have after sales support, meaning that once a product is sold, given that they are sold with some sort of warranty, do you have the capacity to follow up with customers, to repair their units, to replace their units, and to perform a, a number of other functions, right? And, and, and surprisingly, even after just a few months of, uh, of ownership, uh, you know, a lot of people mentioned that they had at least one repair after, after they'd bought their product. And I don't think this is an exclusive a function of say the specific manufacturer we're working with, uh, you run into scenes like this all the time. This is not, again, a product of that manufacturer. When I'm in the field in Africa, I see all the time sort of people trying to fix their own products, not bothering to call to report service. And a lot of these break down and do not perform in the field like, like they do in the lab. In fact, if anything, I would say it's remarkable that the manufacturer we worked with was able to perform so many repairs in such a short limited amount of time. Most of the time, these things aren't repaired once they're sold. And so that's a, that's a real concern, and it might be a function of the way incentives are set up in the social enterprise space, in that your accountability is to your market development supporters, is to scale, is to get out there quickly. Nobody is asking you if, the, if your products are being used for the long term. Nobody is checking whether you're actually honoring your warranties or whether people are, in fact, aware of the warranties or asking to be repaired. So we actually tried to run a field experiment as part of this, where we randomly called some people, and this was just a sample of three. I think we did six round of phone calls where we would call people, and we actually detected a lot more people that based on our calls needed tech support. So, so, so these are the people that actually received some sort of tech support, and we had much greater percentages that we detected something was not going right with those folks, but for whatever reason, they, they weren't calling, right? They didn't realize that it wasn't normal to just have um, two to three hours of light a day, that the solar home system should actually be lasting for six, seven hours a day, and if not, then, then something's wrong. Um, but all that being said, when you ask people how happy they were, customer satisfaction was really, really high, right? So this could be a function of people just being used to being treated, you know, poorly by companies coming in, you know, well, I wasted another 150 bucks, you know, there's no culture of accountability or, 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 or follow-up service in these settings. And it could also be a function that, you know, this is really hard to do. These are tend to be rural areas that these companies are working in. It's just hard to service customers, even the best meaning of social enterprises kind of have limited resources. And if they have to choose between chasing the next sale or fixing an existing client's product, well, more often than not, they're going to choose to chase the next sale, right? So again, a problem of sort of incentive. So we had a really hard time actually even studying this. So now we've actually uh, designed a new approach that we're hoping to study over the next two years, um, funded by Precord, which we're grateful for, where we will look at this question more closely and try to explore in details kind of the effect of after-sale service. So, you know, again, if we look at sort of the number of people that actually stopped using the products, you know, we had 466 people we interviewed at baseline and also targeted at inline interviews. Even, and we had 92% of people, which was quite high, actually do our inline interviews. And for most of the rest, we, even though they refused to do the interview, we still found out what happened with their products. You know, the overwhelming majority, you know, did use their products at inline. And so even though a lot of them had been repaired, so that's encouraging in a way. But again, this is only two to five months for most people after adoption. And there were, you know, 28 people that, that stopped using them altogether. And most of these were cases where a product had been repossessed. A lot of these were credit sales and people stopped making payments and they were possessed. But for, for the majority of them, actually, we saw this coming, right? Because we would call these households and we knew that something was wrong. And we, you know, we kind of tried to alert the company, hey, these people are, probably need some sort of tech support. And, and surprisingly, a lot of them, um, that didn't happen. And so they stopped using it. So you could say, well, 28 out of 466, that's not so bad. That's pretty low churn rate for any industry. But on the other hand, it's a really short-term thing here. You know, you could have potentially with some minimal effort prevented even this, so, so why take it if you don't have to? Not only that, we don't know to what extent the people that are regularly using are actually getting the most out of it, right? It could be that these people are regularly using, but a number of these might have to be repaired again and again and, and things like that. Again, the question is, is the social enterprise model the, uh, the, the preferred way to, to pursue this? So I think sort of in conclusion, um, since we only have about seven, eight minutes left, just recapping the, the sort of assumptions we set out to test here. The first was that, are we serving the bottom of the pyramid? The answer seems to be certainly no, as far as solar home systems go. And um, it also seems to be no from all the evidence that's coming out with, with solar lights. The not so little secret of the industry for some time has been that these, even the smaller ones, are not being bought by the bottom of the economic pyramid. They all seem to be being bought by relatively well-off people. And, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? I think we just need to know that that's what's happening. And so we decide how to allocate market development resources based on the reality on the ground rather than what we hope is happening, that the poorest of the poor are buying these. The next is that 
Are, are they climbing the energy ladder? Well, it doesn't seem to be the case, and it's probably not a very useful construct to, to build policy around in the first place. Uh, but encouragingly, this is some of the first evidence that kerosene is being displaced to a meaningful extent. <clears throat> and it seems like you need a certain scale of system to be able to get that. And those, while the small lights don't seem to do that, the large solar home systems might in fact do that to an appreciable extent. And the lights are just really nice. And I didn't present this here, but we have a lot of data. People seem to really love the lights. Like they, it's just, I, you know, I went into this thinking, oh, it's going to be all about TVs and radios and phone charging. Nobody really cares about lights. But to my surprise, everybody, um, I talked to him, we interviewed, talked about how great the lights are and how their kids can read. You know, this was not kind of prompted, oh, do your kids use this to read? Well, yes, yes, they do, sir. No, it was more, um, you know, we just asked open-ended, what do you like best about this? And people would, would talk about the lights more so than anything else. Um, but disposable batteries used, there was not much of a reduction. And for electronics, maybe we can get greater use of uh, cell phones for sure, but not so much for radios or TVs. And I think that comes a large part of the story there is this sort of pre-investment in appliances where a lot of people have existing stock that they're not quite able to power with their solar solution. No evidence, at least from this trial in Kenya and Uganda, although I'm aware that there is some other evidence from Bangladesh that solar home systems are being used for, for productive uses or in generate income. And uh, whether the social enterprises are the best way to deliver these, or, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a, it's, it's, an, it's, an, it's an open question, right? I think, <clears throat> I think it could be a win-win scenario, but it's not the obvious win-win that maybe we initially thought it was. And we at least need to be aware that there are some tensions between, especially between scale and after-sales service, but also other areas about who your real customers are. Is it, is it your funders, your grant makers, or is it your end users of your products? So I think for, in order for the social enterprise model to really work, um, we at least need to be aware that it's not kind of a self-evident win-win that uh, we need to be aware of where incentives might start to conflict and, um, and, and then build up the industry from there. So with that, I'll wrap it up, and I think we still have about five minutes for Q&A. Thanks. Okay, we'll start with uh, questions from students. Okay, students. Yes. Hi, uh, thanks so much for your talk. I have two questions. The first is if you think that um, more impoverished people will start to adopt the cheaper systems when they, when they see other members of their community with the more advanced systems. And the second is whether any of these operate at a high enough voltage to charge rechargeable AA or AAA batteries. Okay, so um, the first, uh, the second question first, one of the questions was do any of these um, operate at a high enough voltage to charge rechargeable batteries? The answer is yes, the larger home, solar home systems do. The point is there's also not a habit of having rechargeable batteries, double A's and triple A's, so you'd have to introduce those as a new product as well. So to the extent people start using them, yes, maybe you could start getting a thing where you could displace batteries by having rechargeable batteries being used. Um, and the other question was, well, maybe the bottom of the economic pyramid will start adopting these once kind of the not so bottom of the economic pyramid sets expectations. And I think, you know, this is just my personal guess, but I would think that there's, there's reason to believe that they, that would be the case, right? That is usually the way markets are, are built up, right? I mean, it, most consumer technologies, consumer goods, that's kind of how things work. You know, the electric cars here, we didn't start with, you know, Tesla's Model 3 and then slowly work up to a Model S and then work up to something more advanced, right? It seems to be kind of coming down. And once we see people with these cool things, as they get cheaper, you get, but the, I guess the point I was trying to make is that we seem to have taken a different approach in the solar off-grid solar space. And it might be the right one, but at least we should be explicit in recognizing that it's not the way things usually work, the way we would expect them to work. Like you said, maybe the bottom of it, the pyramid eventually gets it once it's well established by kind of more prominent members of the community. And if we're gonna do that, at least we should be explicit that that's what we're doing and have a reason for why we think that's a better approach than, than, than we would, we've actually pursued in practice. Okay, uh, how about back there? Yeah, Michael. Uh, so you talked about the reason people buying lanterns as a, a means of getting better quality lighting, yeah. kind of at the end of the use. Uh, did you also ask the same question at the beginning? Mm -hmm. um, and it seems like you had like an A, B, C, D choice. Did you also have an open question, like a story? Can you tell me a story? As yep. opposed to yeah, choose? we had a number. Yeah, so our, data, our surveys were too long. I learned at the baseline that I made too long of a survey, and people were very patient and giving with their time. We asked at both baseline and end line, we asked at baseline, you know, why are you buying the system as an open-ended question, not as an ABCD source. And a lot of people talked about lighting even there. And at end line, people certainly, if you ask them what's it most useful, talked about lighting. So um, this sort of what's it good for question that I had. Oh. 
too, it's too long. Kind of what's your system good for question? That was a kind of an ABCD, but those were actually just kind of phone-based interviews. At Edline, it was more of an open-ended one that we then coded, right? So we didn't really want to push people one way or the other. Did anybody change? So I haven't looked at the individual impacts uh, as much. I think people changed in the sense that at baseline, there was more people talking about uh, phone charging or even starting a business or watching TV. A lot of people thought that any size system they would buy could power their existing TV or any old cheap CRT TV. So they would say, I'm buying this for TV. And in deadline, you say, what do you use it for? Well, it's lights. Well, because it turns out to be able to power TV, I have to buy a small energy efficient one. And if I buy the cheap, large one that's affordable to me, it's not going to be very usable. So we saw changes mostly in that direction. Okay, yeah. Um, I was just wondering, from the photos you showed of the shops, yeah. selling the whole home solar system, it seems like fairly large systems. And it just, it just seems, um, uh, I'm not sure whether that really tests whether you're serving the bottom of the pyramid because the companies who sell the really small lights with the small panels built in market those as the real bottom product, whereas they acknowledge that these big systems are not serving the bottom of the pyramid. Right, so, so two things. First, the picture I showed was of a much bigger shop, not to not identify the specific manufacturer we worked with. So that was actually a shop in a bigger town, just kind of showing that the marketplace is there. The, the systems we, we tracked, but to be fair, they were kind of the larger systems. Um, starting at you know at least uh, at least 50 watt panels and and I think I, I mentioned a little bit you're gonna talk yeah right like these are not cheap the cheapest ones of them were about a hundred dollars if you were to pay cash up front and a uh, hundred twenty two hundred thirty dollars if you're going to finance it over the course of a year with monthly payments so so sure right and and that makes sense and if that's what we want to say I think that's fine right these are products for relatively high end consumers what I was trying to highlight is that the adopters of these systems did not climb the energy ladder to get there. Like it wasn't a requirement to have some sort of base of small, cheap product users for them to, to work up to this level. It's that there was a pre-existing base of demand that, and that maybe if we had, um, we have focused some of the market development support towards these solar home systems earlier, where just the UN is only now getting, or rather Lighting Global is only now getting into this game of trying to support these solar home systems. Maybe if they had done it a few years ago, the market would have developed even faster and maybe done what, what, what was asked here as far as making the solar lights cheaper for the bottom of the economic pyramid. Because the solar home system companies, they had to basically rely on their own without any market. They weren't getting any market development support precisely because the assumption was, well, they won't serve the bottom of the pyramid as well. But I think some of, if you look at some of the other research that's coming out, or if you talk to most practitioners, they'll also kind of start to, at least in, in, in Kenya and Uganda, they often talk that even the early adopters of the solar lights, the really cheap products, are not, in fact, the, the bottom of the pyramid. And they're just people that are relatively rich. And they couldn't get a solar home system, so they got the thing that they could, which was a cheaper light, because nothing else was available to them. OK, more questions. OK, yeah, I'll here. Yeah. Uh, what? what? of these customers had bought the systems on credit and was it formal lease to own or was it credit financing from the this shop? Was, this, was a, um, this was a credit financing from the shop and, but they would, they would own it at the end of repayment and I think um, well over 85% of the systems we studied were, were sort of on, on credit and the payments were anywhere from 8 to $15, $16 a month, sometimes more. Some of the cash upfront systems for the really large only handful of these systems it was two, three hundred dollars, or three hundred dollars, and a few of those were cash upfront sales, but they were mostly um, credit sales. And I think that's one way that maybe you do keep after sale service going, right? If you don't honor your warranty, people people will just stop paying, right? Um, so that's that's potentially an encouraging way to do that aspect of it. Sadly, I've been told we need to wrap up. So uh, anyway, thank you. Right. So I'll much. be around if you want yeah. to come up. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you.